camp And I took back what he stole from me I took back what he stole from me I took back what he stole from me I went to the enemy's camp And I took back what he stole from me He's under my feet Come on now He's under my feet I said he's under my feet He's under my feet, you know he's under my feet, he's under my feet, Satan is under my feet. Can you believe what the Lord has done in me? Can you believe what the Lord has done in me? Hallelujah. You know he saved me, cleansed me, turned me. The lame man was sitting outside the gate begging all those who entered in. And Peter and John, they came upon them, and that lame man was expecting them. Peter said, silver and gold, have I none but such as I have, I give unto thee. The spirit touched that lame man, and he leaped to his feet, saying, Look what he's done for me. Come on now. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me. It was just, just in time. time. I'm going to praise his name. He stayed just the same. sin I had no hope no peace of mine my sins were as scarlet but he washed them white as snow and he opened up my blinded eyes my soul now rejoices since I made him my choice I got love peace and everything I need glory my name is written down in the lambs for the light can you see what he's done for me come on now Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me. It was just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Each day he's just the same. Come on and praise him. Look what the Lord has done. I said I was bound by chains of sin. I had no hope, no peace of mind. My sins were scarlet, but he washed them white as snow, and he opened up my blinded eyes. Now my soul does rejoice since I made him my choice. I got love, peace, and everything I need. My name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Can you see what he's done for me? Yeah. Look what the Lord has done. Glory. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me. It was just in time. I'm going to praise his name. Each day is just the same.
just the same. Come on and praise Him. 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 Look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Look what the Lord. Go ahead, Pam. Look what the Lord, glory, look what the Lord, I don't know about you, but you know there's somebody standing next to you, somebody in your family, there's something that you thought was never going to come to pass, and God changed that thing and turned it around, hallelujah, glory, how many of you have been healed by the Lord, how many of you have been healed by the Lord, hallelujah, look what the Lord has, has done, yeah, 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 look what the Lord has Jesus, yeah. tell him all about our trouble. He will hear our faintest cry. He will answer by and by. Now when you feel a little prayer will turn in, you know a Holy Ghost fire is burning. Just a little talk with Jesus makes it right. Will I and fears Come on now. these eyes may fill with tears and then a cloud of doubt may hide the light of day you know the mist of sin may rise to try to hide those starry skies yeah. but just a little talk with Jesus clears the way That wasn't on the schedule, so I pulled that on. That's fine, it went well. I see the Lord seated on the throne, exalted, and the train of his robe feels until.
before the Lord and just say thank you. Jesus loves you so much and maybe you don't understand it. Maybe you're saying to yourself, I can't see what they see or Lord, how do I see? He brings you light. He brings you revel revelation. But he must be Savior first. He is Lord. He is Lord. Awesome presence in the house. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you for the glory that fills this place. We invite you, Father, to just take complete charge of this, this service. In Jesus' name. Amen. Today is the last Sunday we'll do two morning services. It'll just be a 1030 service, so you might need to get here a little bit early to get a seat. Those of you that come in halfway through the worship, you're missing something anyway. So just thought I'd say that. Just saying. Just glad you're here. Amen. And what's been on my heart this week is uh, learning to recover. Last uh, yesterday, just yesterday, we did a memorial service for a young man that overdosed on drugs and didn't make it. He had left the Teen Challenge program. Parents had prayed, people had tried to help, but how many know you have a decision to make yourself? But there's no judgment. There's just heartbreak and compassion and concern for hurting families. You say, Pastor, what do you preach? I preach that the Holy Spirit will comfort you, but I warn that this was not God's will. It's a diabolical teaching that everything that happens is God's will. And if you have that kind of theology, you need to wake up and realize that if that were the case, we wouldn't have to come to God and get saved and submit our will to His. 
As we get into the text this morning, you'll see some things are the will of Satan. The Bible said, Jesus said in John 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. You say, well, pastor, why doesn't God intervene? Because he's given us free choice. The tragedy of the wickedness of sin is the innocent always suffer for the guilty. How many has been heartbroken when you see children that suffer for the sins of adults? Atrocious abuses abound and you say, why doesn't God intervene? He's told us to take care of this planet. He's commissioned and gave the authority of the planet to Adam and Eve, to humanity, and he hasn't taken it back. Tragically, we submit to Satan and thus he becomes the God of this world, little g. But can I tell you something? Jesus is coming back soon. Amen. And it's all going to change. Every wrong will be made right. And we'll be able, think about this, to look at the six or 7,000 years of recorded human history in eternity and we'll see the horrible effects of sin. Amen. So well, why didn't God just do away with the devil to start with? Because you wouldn't have understood how much he loved you if you didn't know, didn't know hate. You wouldn't understand he was a healer if no one was ever sick. You wouldn't understand. How many understand contrast reveals? Even in photography, there has to be a balance of light and dark to see. And so God wants creation. He wants, first of all, to give you a choice. I mean, no, he even gave the angels choice. One third decided not to serve him. He's given you a choice, but he's letting you see when you look at the atrocities of war, the evils that humans can inflict on humans, and you see the horrible things done to uh, all this around us. God is letting it play out, but when he comes back, he'll make every wrong right. And we'll be able to look back forever when you're tempted, if you ever are, to rebel. You'll remember the results of rebellion against God. He said, but pastor, why should the innocent suffer for the guilty? Had God remained aloof, it would not have been just or fair. But he came down in the person of his son. And the ultimate innocence suffered for us, the guilty, on Calvary's cross to redeem us and give us eternal life. The prophet said, you'll say the way of the Lord isn't equal. Oh, it is. It's just the ways of man have become so wicked that we see the results of that. I don't know about you, but I'd love to hear the trumpet sound today. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me to 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 through 26. How many of you want to serve the Lord? You want to be servants of the Lord? About half of you. I appreciate that. <laughs> the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. Patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. How many can see a satanic will involved here? But God says, I'm sending some servants that's going to rescue and teach people to recover. Isn't that incredible? And I want to know if you want to be a servant of God. The first thing that the passage says is the servant of the Lord must not strive. Now what this literally means is you can't be quarrelsome and hateful and have an attitude of always wanting to pick an argument with somebody. Amen. Some of you are more concerned about being liked on Facebook and being right than you are reaching the lost. And guess what? None of us are right all the time. He's right all the time. And we ought to be pointing to him instead of patting ourselves on the back. If you can see, it's because he gave you sight. Amen. And so the servant of the Lord must not strive. And when, when the Bible talks about Jesus coming as the ultimate servant of the Lord, it says he will not strive nor cry, neither will his voice be heard in the streets. In other words, he's not going to be argumentative and screaming and hateful. And it said a smoking flax he will not quench. 
and a bruised reed he will not break. And that's a beautiful passage. In other words, if there's just a spark left, he's going to fan it back to a flame. He's not going to get rid of you. If you've been bruised and hurt and you're broken, even if it's your own fault, he's not going to break you all the way. He's going to repair you. He's going to work on you. He's going to restore you because he needs you to restore others. And so this, this, these instructions are so pertinent. This, this right here, if you're in ministry, this verse here, if it's taken and, and you try to live this, it will change your life and your ministry. When I first started preaching, I, I, I wanted to straighten people out. So I'd get miffed about some things and I'd go through my Bible and find all the verses I could use to get them when I got in the pulpit the next time. I'm being real. That's the way I grew up. I knew somebody was, you, you pick up on, I just need to watch it here. Preachers would pick up on the gossip and then they'd have their sermon subject. I'd rather get my sermon subject from the Holy Spirit than some disgruntled, long-tongued gossip. Amen. I mean, I grew up in a church where women had long hair and long dresses and long tongues. <laughs> a lot of them were good. Don't, don't misunderstand me. A lot of those people were very godly and really loved God. But sometimes the focus was wrong. And one day I got a revelation that I'm supposed to read the Bible in context and find out who wrote it, who they're talking to, what they're talking about, what they're addressing. And it's revolutionary to let God say what he wants to say. How many would like it if somebody just took certain words out of your conversation for a day and share them with everybody without using context? We do that to God, don't we? We shouldn't. Apt to teach, not quarrelsome. Second point, apt to teach. Ezekiel 44, 23. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And ministers are afraid of this kind of teaching in the day that we live in. They don't want to be disliked. They don't want to be politically incorrect. They don't want taken off of social media. But I'm going to tell you something. It is our job to call sin, sin, and talk about the difference between evil and righteousness and the difference between the clean and the unclean. Because God wants to sanctify his people. Everybody say sanctify. That's an old word you don't hear in church anymore. They used to argue in the Pentecostal circles about if it was a one-time experience or if it was a daily experience. And you know the answer to that? Yes. Amen. God, he, he, he wants his people to know. Because you see, you can't shine in the darkness if you're just like the darkness. Nobody's going to, if there's not a difference, nobody's going to want what you have. If you have the same addictions and the same foul language and the same attitudes and the same uh, hatefulness that they have, and you just go to church on Sunday, that don't make you a Christian any more than a mouse being in a cookie jar becomes a cookie. God help us to know the difference. I want the world to see Jesus in me. I want to teach the difference. Now, it didn't say shove it down people's throat. It didn't say scream at them and tell them they were going to hell. How many know they all tell each other to go to hell anyway? Amen? You know you've heard that. To be honest, you've said it sometimes. And here's what I said this morning. I want to repeat it. Let's make a habit of telling folks to go to heaven. That sounds weird. Look at somebody near you and say, why don't you go to heaven? <laughs> now, you're used to hearing the other, aren't you? But we need, to <laughs> we need to wake up and have the right attitude. Folks, if our attitude is nasty, we're not going to lead anybody to sweet Jesus. I, I love him. He's awesome. He's wonderful. And he's been so forgiving to me. So I want to teach you the difference between right and wrong. But while I'm teaching against wrong, let me tell you a stinking self-righteous attitude is sin too. That's right? right? Amen. amen. It's right whether you amen or not. Apt to teach, not quarrelsome, not striving. Apt to teach. Third, patience. 
Oh, God help us. <laughs> God has been so patient with you. He really has. I don't know how he's put up with me for almost 62 years. Because I'll be doing pretty good and then I'll just mess up. And my wife has put up with me for 40 some years. I mean, God's grace has been awful good. And patience, I want you to see this. How many has ever seen a, a coach that could see a player's potential? And even though the player fumbles the ball, and even though they make mistakes, and they don't always follow the uh, directions of the quarterback, still the coach sees the potential. And instead of deriding them all the time for their mistakes, he builds up their abilities by showing them their potential. That's what God wants out of us in the lives of others. Be somebody's coach and tell them, yeah, you might have fumbled the ball, but the game ain't over. Amen. Right. Amen. You still have a chance to reach the goal. Yeah. Patient. They used to say in the old church, don't pray for patience because tribulation worketh patience. I got news for you. You're going to get to tribulation anyway, so you might as well benefit from it by praying for patience. In this world, you will, does Jesus say this? Have tribulation. So when it comes, say, God, teach me through this. Help me to pass this test this time. Some say, I don't know why I keep going through the th same test. Well, maybe you've never passed it. Huh? Well, God's not speaking to me while I'm going through this test. The teacher is always silent during the test. But it's an open book test. Be patient with others. God's been so patient with you. And there have been times that I've just, uh, you know, I, I, God, hurry up and give me patience. Huh? I, I want to be real, but folks, if you don't have any patience with folks, you're never going to help anybody because we, we're on a, on a journey. The path of the just, Proverbs said, is as a shining light that shineth more and more to that perfect light of day. And so what we need to understand is while I'm walking on this path, sometimes I'll trip, I'll fall down, I'll stumble, I'll even slip backwards sometimes and backslide a little, but I'm still facing the right direction and I'm still climbing the hill and I need somebody who will help me me up when I fall, who will encourage me when I mess up, who won't write me off when I make mistakes, and I want to be patient with others like God's been patient with me. This is what Paul said. I'm so glad that God chose the Apostle Paul to write most of the New Testament. Would you have chosen somebody whose goal in life was to imprison and see as many Christians tortured and killed as possible, would you have chosen them to be an apostle? Huh? Paul said, that there's a reason why God stopped me in my tracks on the road to Damascus, going to haul Christians to prison, and Jesus stopped him dead in his tracks and revealed himself to him and changed his life. And Paul said, here's why he did it. So I know it's by grace alone that I'm saved. And so others would see no matter what they have done that God's grace is big enough to handle it and bring forgiveness and redemption to them. Isn't that crazy? He said that. He said, God chose me who was the chief of sinners. As an example to others, when you, how many ever talked to somebody and they said, I've just been too rotten. God, God could never forgive me. Have you run into that? I have. Say, so let me tell you about this guy in the Bible that wrote the scriptures that we quote the most out of the New Testament. Let me tell you what he did. Let me tell you about the woman at the well that Jesus made an evangelist out of it. And she brought a whole city to Christ. You know what? She had been married four times and was shacking up with somebody else's husband when she met Jesus. Amen? But you know what? The difference is when they brought somebody to Jesus like the woman taken in the act of adultery, he didn't say, neither do I condemn thee have at it. But he changed their lives. They were never the same again. Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. Now, he didn't mean go be perfect. He meant don't go back to a lifestyle of deliberate sin after I've forgiven you. Apt to teach. Patient. We exhort you, brethren. 1 Thessalonians 5.14. 
We exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. If you love somebody, how many of you warn them? You do it in the spirit of love, but you'll warn them. Comfort the feeble-minded. Now, that don't mean what we'd think about being feeble-minded in today's English, King James English. What it means is those who have had a confusion in their mind and they're about to give up because of the confusion. Amen. How many's ever been there? Has your mind ever been in a turmoil? You've been faint-hearted and, and, and you just can't get it together in your mind. Sometimes, you know what my prayer, I found a prayer in the Bible that's just, just one sentence long with a comma in it. And I pray it sometimes and it might shock you because I'm the pastor. But it has gotten me out and raised me up because how many knows he answers the cry of your heart? Here's the prayer. This father comes to Jesus Jesus says, do you believe I can do this? And he said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. How many know the enemy will attack your mind with unbelief and with doubt and confusion? And that's not the people that we say, oh, what's the matter with you? I went to a preacher one time with a question. I was struggling with something in the Bible and, and I wanted him to help me and I was sincere and I looked at him as an elder that, that, that would help me and, and, and I said, I, I need you to explain this to me about God. And he said, well, even the devil knows there's only one God. Are you dumber than the devil? And he stomped off. I'm telling you, if I hadn't had others around me I could have, did you know there are people out of church now that are just out there because somebody wasn't patient, somebody wasn't gentle, somebody had the wrong attitude and they presented the gospel in a wrong way. And I'm going to hear, I'm going to say something here you might not agree with. I'd re rather meet somebody wrong in their doctrine and right in their spirit than somebody right in their doctrine with a stinking spirit. Because God can change and straighten you out on your doctrine if you have the right spirit. But the words that he speaks are both spirit and life and their truth. How many of the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth? God just, you know why I'm preaching like this to you all? Because he's working on me on this stuff. I want to be, the Bible says the husbandman must be first partaker of the fruit. I remember mama telling me, son, when you get up there and take out the sword of the spirit, it's going to cut you just like everybody else. And the word works on the pastor and the preacher and the evangelist. And anybody tells you that they've arrived, get away from them because if they're that far ahead of you, they can't help you anyway. <laughs> Patient. Meek. Meekness. In meekness instructing those. It means that that's humility. That's not weakness. I don't want you to misunderstand meekness and weakness. Jesus said the meek will inherit the earth. Meekness. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Now, he didn't say this happens automatically. He said this is something you have to learn. Learn of me for I am meek and lowly. In heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Did anybody see that big, tough dad with that little tiny baby this morning standing up here? That's meekness. What would you think if he wanted to arm wrestle with that baby to show how strong he was? Huh? Why am I saying that? Because hear me if you're arrogant and you're not meek, you're not secure in your strength. Because when you're secure in your strength, you don't have to flaunt anything. You operate in meekness. If the creator of the universe, God in the flesh, he who spoke the worlds into existence, could say, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. If he could be meek, what's wrong with us? Nobody's going to receive anything from somebody that is operating in arrogance Instead of meekness, quiet, gentle strength. He said, in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves. In meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves that they can learn to recover, that they may recover. 
Tell somebody near you, I want you to recover. This is good. Now, we want to teach people how to recover. That's, that's my last point this morning. We want them to know that they don't have to give up when they make mistakes. Amen. Oh, watch this. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Now, the newer translation says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose you. And it's saying that they're opposing the teacher. And the King James says they're opposing themselves. Which one is right? Again, yes. When you oppose the teaching of the Word of God, you're opposing and impeding your own progress, and you're in opposition to yourself. That attitude you have toward other people, that's not bothering them near as much as it's eating you up. You're opposing yourself. <laughs> Help me, Lord. In meekness. And listen. Listen. Galatians 6, 1 through 3, brethren, if anyone is overtaken in a trespass, ye who are spiritual, gossip about them and tell people you'd never do what they do and, and get online and, and blast them and make sure people know who they are even though you're not using their name. It, it, I must be reading from the wrong book here. That's not what this Bible says. If a man is overtaken in any trespass, any you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's buildings, so bear one another's burdens. <laughs> that was a crazy blooper. <laughs> Just leave that in there. You don't even have to edit it out, Rodney. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And listen to this next line. For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Is that how we deal with people that are struggling? If you're spiritual, you won't see them restored. I know <laughs> it'd be all right with me if the trumpet sounded today. I mean, I, I would like to just have at it. I, I was, uh, I read a story about this youth pastor who kept falling asleep in staff meeting. And he did it so much that uh, they came up with a plan. They all brought an extra change of clothes with them. And one guy brought his trumpet. And when he fell asleep, they all slipped out and left their clothes and shoes on the seats. And then they blew the trumpet. And he thought he missed the rapture. <laughs> I wonder if he ever fell asleep in staff meeting again. I don't know. We had an incident here. We'd had a funeral on a Sunday afternoon, and there was so much food left over that the Sunday night service, we invited everybody that was at the Sunday evening service over next door for dinner after the service. And a lady pulled up in the parking lot, and the parking lot was full of cars, and the lights were on. She said, wow, church is still going on. I'm going to go in and see what's happening. And she came in and couldn't find a soul, and the lights were on, and the doors were unlocked, and the parking lot was full of cars, and she began to weep, and then she saw somebody coming out of the fellowship hall. I said, I doubt everybody would have left anyway. Now, don't look at me in that tone of voice. Bear one another's burdens. So fulfill the law of Christ. Listen, I want to tell you, there's a guy named Abram whose name is later changed to Abraham. We've been studying about him Friday morning. Bible studies, band of brothers, and he made some mistakes. He didn't do everything right, but his heart was right. And he took a nephew named Lot along with him, and there came a time when there was some conflict in the family. How many know sometimes you get along with relatives better if they live in the next town? Watch how you answer that. And so Abram said, I don't want conflict. We're brothers. He said, you choose whatever part of this land that you want, and I'll take the other. 
And that selfish young rascal took all the good green pasture and left Abram with the rocky mountainside. And anybody, have you seen that Judean wilderness? It's rough. But Abram thought more of harmony and doing what was right in his call of God than he did getting his way. And just don't ever make a decision based just on finances. Seek God about his vision for your life. Soon as Lot walked away with his, all of his property and his selfish choice, God said, lift up your eyes, Abram. Look northward, westward, eastward, southward. I'm going to give you all that you can see. He said, Pastor, what's that got to do with your sermon? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked because I'm getting to that. He pitched his tent towards Sodom, wicked city. And he kept moving closer till he was living in Sodom. And folks, even though he was rescued, it sure messed up his family. Those of you that know the story, I want you to hear me. There's a battle, four kings against five. They capture all the wealth of the, of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain. They capture Lot, Lot and his children and his wife, and they take all the wealth of those cities, and they take them all captive and you know what? If I'd have been Abram, I'd have said, that's what that rascal gets. He's reaping what he sowed. But you know what he did? He went by night with 318 trained servants and attacked those partying, probably drunk armies that thought nobody else was around to whip them and brought total deliverance to Lot, even though Lot had hurt him and ripped him off. Are you hearing me? Hurting people hurt people. And when you try to help people, sometimes they'll hurt you. But let's be a friend of God. How many know Jesus said he was my friend? Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Before Abraham was, I am. And Abraham became known as the friend of God. I could tell you a lot more about that, but I don't have time today. The second time Lot needed rescued... Abraham went into deep intercession with the Lord himself about sparing the city. Are you hearing me? You know what Abraham was? He was a rescuer. He was one who was apt to teach and patient, gently instructing those who oppose themselves. He was being, now he wasn't perfect and neither are you, but he was being a rescuer. Here's what I want you to do. Don't just always be Lot needing rescued. But when you're rescued, use your liberty to bring liberty and rescue to somebody else. Amen. I, I love this passage of Scripture because it gets to where we live. A servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all, apt to teach and patient, in meekness instructing those who oppose themselves. If God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. How many understand the word repentance don't just mean cry and snot and get up and act the way you always did? Oh, we had revival. Everybody went to the altar and cried and they shouted all over the church and they went out the next day and lived just like they always did. That's not repentance. Now, I'm all for the crying and the shouting. But Dad used to say it don't matter how high you jump, it's how straight you walk when you hit the ground. I want to see changed lives. Repentance, metanoia means I'm going in this direction and God gets a hold of me and turns me around and sends me in another direction. You know why that happened? Somebody was gentle with me. Somebody taught me. Somebody was patient with me and they showed me that I needed to repent. And then they taught me how to recover. Is that in, that, is that in the Bible? First of all, if you're struggling, you need somebody to help you recover. Thank God for you, because we all need that from time to time. Amen? But don't just always be like Lot. Once in a while, be like Abram and rescue somebody else, intercede for somebody else. Use what God has done in your recovery to help somebody else recover. 
that they may learn to recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who's they're taken captive of him at his will and to do his will. You know, sometimes we make the devil's job easy. I'll give you one example. One of his titles is the accuser of the brethren. <laughs> he don't have to do much. Church folks will do that for him. Quit looking at me like that, some of you. You love it when I preach against all them wicked people out there, but I'm, I'm to deal with you folks in here. I, I can't help anybody out there while I'm in here. I'm trying to get you to realize that your ministry is out there. Amen. You come here to take what you're given here from the Holy Spirit and make a difference in somebody's life out there. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of truth, oh, thank God for that, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Anybody want to be a servant of God now? That's how you do it. This passage of Scripture is how you minister to other people. It is so concise. It couldn't be any more precise or put together any better for you. So stand with me. And whatever side of the situation you're on, this altar is open. I won't be there to rescue you. Amen. I haven't made it to heaven yet. Sometimes I need somebody to help me, straighten me out. Right? I want to be real. So let's worship. There's a sweet presence of the Lord in this house. And let's not just run off and try to beat the Methodists and the Baptists to Don Paco's. Let's spend some time in his presence and let him deal with our hearts. In Jesus' name.
sing that last verse again. I searched for peace among the shadows, dark and lonely. I gave up. But to 